Let's say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God Almighty, we find ourselves here on a Friday, and we turn to you to praise you and thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus, who laid down his life for us with such generosity and with such love, with such uh, loving obedience to you. We rejoice, uh, Lord, in that great gift, the greatest of all gifts that you have given to us. May we appreciate our Lord Jesus, his sacrifice. May we grow in our love for him. May we desire to live our faith more authentically and generously and joyfully each day. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, an airline pilot had uh, been flying into a city, and it was just uh, totally windy. And uh, he had been having some stuff going on in his life, and so he wasn't on his A-game. And so between the wind and not being on his A-game, he brought that plane down pretty darn hard. Uh, but the, the, you know, the airline had this policy that he kind of had to stand at the end there and greet everybody as they're leaving. And he was having a little bit of a difficult time looking people in the eye as, as he was, thank you for flying United, you know. And, and, uh, and so this goes on for a while, and he's kind of relieved that no one's really given him too much heat. And then uh, finally at the end, he thought everybody's gone, and then he turned around, and there was an, an elderly woman coming out. And uh, she stopped and she said, um, you know, can, can I ask you a question? He said, sure, ma'am, what, what, what's, what's your question? He says, D did we land or were we shot down? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are uh, deep into this series of reflections on the Eucharist. And before we jump into the topic for today, which is the Eucharistic miracles, um, I really wanted to uh, recap a couple of things uh, with you. And so, um, I, something that just deeply inspires me is the fact that there are so many things in the Old Testament that point to Christ, and in particular to the Eucharist. And so, you know, we have the, the bread and wine that was offered by the high priest Melchizedek, we mentioned in the first Eucharistic prayer. And that was, you know, when Abraham, uh, his, his nephew Lot, had been cap captured. And so Abraham had to go out on a little bit of a military adventure. And he had conquered a few kings and rescued his nephew Lot. And when he came back, Melchizedek was there to greet him. And Melchizedek was this mysterious priest. And Melchizedek made an offering of bread and wine in thanksgiving for the success of this adventure. The man in the desert. You know, the, the people were starving. They were begging God to take care of them, to give them food. And he provides this manna that is mysterious to them. They've never seen this before. And it appears every morning to feed them in this journey through the desert. Every morning, this manna appears, right? And then, of course, the greatest of all the symbols for the Jews, period, and even in reference to the Eucharist, is the Paschal Lamb chosen from among all of the lambs, slain, blood sprinkled, and then they eat the roasted flesh. And the idea behind when, you know, there were some sacrifices that you just totally gave over, and there were some sacrifices that you, you cooked, so to say. You killed, and you offered, and you cooked, but when you ate it, it was a sign of unity with God. And so this unblemished lamb in the blood, right? So 
some Old Testament ones, some New Testament ones. Certainly the wedding at Cana, where Jesus transforms water into wine, right? Which then he will later transform into his, his precious blood, right? The miracle of the loaves and the fishes, where Jesus mysteriously feeds large crowds back then, very large crowds, with the little that in one instance, at least, that a boy offers. The little bit that a human offers, God feeds. Right? The power that Jesus exercises over nature on so many levels, right? The walking on the water, the calming of the storm, the healing of a blind man from birth. It's a little different than a regular blind man, a blind man from birth, right? The raising of Lazarus from the dead. Jesus' power over nature. Certainly the beautiful instruction on the Eucharist in John 6, but then Jesus' own institution of the Eucharist, right, at the Last Supper, where he actually gives us his body and blood to eat. Then the, the uh, surprising recognition of Christ in the breaking of the bread in Emmaus on Easter Sunday, the revealing statements and the acts of the apostles that the early Christians had dedicated themselves to the breaking of the bread, the account of the institution of the Eucharist in St. Paul, right, who was not one of the apostles, right, in 1 Corinthians, and that challenge that he gives to us to carefully examine ourselves before we participate in the Eucharist so that we don't eat and drink judgment on ourselves, quote, and then the early fathers of the church who help us to better understand this mystery. Um, I briefly review these things that we've really been covering throughout this year very intentionally today. Because our faith in the Eucharist rests on these events and the teaching of Jesus Christ and his church in the sacred scriptures and in the sacred tradition of the church, right? So our faith is centered in these things, in the Eucharist. The bountiful miracles that have taken place for 2,000 years connected um, are important, and they're helpful. They're super helpful. They're fascinating. They're inspiring. But our faith does not rest in them. Doesn't rest in them. And that's important, right? You don't have to believe in those miracles to be a Christian, a Catholic Christian, right? And so they are manifestations of the truth taught by Christ and included in the scriptures and sacred tradition and attested to by the saints. So with that in mind, I want to look at two of the Eucharistic miracles. I want, and I'm going to begin with uh, St. Clair just because. In part, she's uh, a patron saint of the women youth apostles, and, uh, and in part, she's a little connected to St. Francis, one of ours. Right? So, so she was a devotee of St. Francis of Assisi, I think we all know that, and was captivated by a Lenten sermon that he gave in the church of San Giorgio right there in Assisi. And she ends up uh, leaving her family in a kind of a, a difficult thing situation as well. She's the founder of the Poor Clares, a sister community of the Franciscan Friars. St. Francis builds a house for her right next to the chapel of San Damiano. And, uh, and so the sisters are there. And in 1224, uh, the Muslims were approaching, under Frederick II, were approaching Assisi to come and attack it. And those roving bands of men back then were often brutal with women. And so here they are. San Damiano is at the foot of Assisi, which is a walled city, but there's nothing walled around them. And so here the Muslims are coming, and they're going to come upon a house of 20 nuns. And St. Clair goes to the tabernacle and takes out the Eucharist and puts the Lord in a monstrance 
and goes to a, a rather large open window at the second floor of this, this house, and she stands there with the Eucharist. And something frightens these guys, and they all take off, and they run in the opposite direction, and they don't attack the women, and they don't attack a Caesar. And there's n no, no good explanation for this reality. And so St. Clair is often, I mean, one of the images of her in, um, you know, kind of common iconography is holding a monstrance, one of my favorites of Clair. Secondly, I wish to share with you the story of a, the, one of the more famous miracles that happened in the town of, of Bolsena in Italy. And so there was a, a German priest who was on his way to Rome, and he stopped in this town, which has a a rather famous church dedicated to St. Christina. And so St. Christina um, is buried there, and there's actually some uh, kind of, uh, you know, ancient ruins underneath this church, somewhat like the catacombs. And uh, so this church was fairly well known, but it's in a tiny town of Bolsena. And so he came there to stop on his way, and he was celebrating Mass, and as he celebrated Mass and held up the host at the consecration, it began to bleed. And it bled down on the corporal, on the, on the altar, and it bled onto the, the altar itself, and it bled onto the, the floor. And the priest uh, did something that they don't encourage us to do in the seminary. He stopped celebrating Mass <laughs> and ran to a nearby town, city, really, because it just so happened that the Pope was there. And so this was the town of Orvieto. And so he runs there uh, to go tell the Pope of what happened. And the Pope uh, establishes a commission kind of immediately and does research into this event immediately and determines that he thinks that there's no natural reason for this and that he thinks that this really is a miracle of the Eucharist. And uh, so he, he kind of keeps the corporal um, in this church in Orvieto. So uh, although it took place in Bolsena, the, the, the corporal stays in Orvieto, which I think is fascinating, but that's, that's uh, the way that life goes sometimes. But the Pope was so inspired by this miracle that he determined that he was going to establish the feast of Corpus Christi. So he establishes this feast, uni you know, universal feast for the church. And then in addition, it just so happens that there's a, a rather famous Dominican theologian studying in Orvieto at the same time, who just so happens to be St. Thomas Aquinas. And so he, the Pope asks him to write the prayers for this Mass, you know, the, the collect and the, the, uh, <clears throat> um, the preface prayer and so forth. Uh, and then uh, he also penned the, uh, the words for a number of hymns that we use at adoration in particular, the Tantum Ergo and the O Salutaris and I think the Adorote Devote as well. And so, um, so this all, you know, kind of was in part uh, the fruit of this particular miracle. And so, again, my brothers and sisters, our faith in the sacrament of the Eucharist does not rest on these miracles, uh, but on the revealed Word of God in sacred scripture and in sacred tradition. At the same time, these miracles are very inspiring. And I uh, leave for Assisi <laughs> and Balsena uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> and the truth be told, we're going to be in Balsena and Assisi on Wednesday uh, as we arrive, because you fly through the night, right? And so we're going to be in both of those places. So that's another reason why I chose these two miracles, because I'm going to see them both. Uh, in the next few days. So um, please count on uh, my prayers for you at Mass and at these holy places during this pilgrimage. And I ask that you pray for, pray for those who are going on this pilgrimage, that it be truly a, a time of uh, conversion and renewal of faith in our Lord, especially uh, through the grace of
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs>